I'm going to start this video with a bit of a rhetorical question. So just thinking it through, what good do you think a habitat patch would be for wildlife if it's only around for a short amount of time? So conceptually, you might think that a habitat which is ephemeral or temporary um, would be less sought after uh, for various types of wildlife. But I'm here to tell you guys that isn't always the case. And a perfect example of this is vernal pools. So what is a vernal pool exactly? A vernal pool is essentially a small isolated forest depression, which fills up with water temporarily, but then loses its water later in the season as the weather gets warmer. It's a bit of a long-winded definition, but they are fairly complex wetlands. And after I break down each component, which contributes to you know what makes a vernal pool special, I think you'll have a, a much better picture. So as I mentioned, vernal pools form within forest depressions. As you might expect, the landscape here in the Northeast, which is mountainous by nature, is by no means flat. And so there are all kinds of depressions scattered throughout the landscape. And it's within these depressions that vernal pools tend to basically situate and establish. The forested context is actually really important for the critters that use these vernal pools. And I'll explain more, more about that in just a bit. Another component of vernal pools, which makes them special is their size. So these are small and shallow forest depressions and these dimensions lend themselves to the periodic filling of water and uh, the pools drying up as well, which is among the most important characteristics of vernal pools, which I'll touch on more in a second. But these dimensions are very important components to vernal pools. Another component I mentioned is isolation. And so these are isolated bodies of water. They're not connected to any permanent body of water, which can feed them throughout the year. That's not to say that they can't be fed by say like a mountain seep or a spring or anything like that, but the seeps and springs, if they are feeding a vernal pool, tend to dry up as well. And all of these factors bring me to perhaps the most important, and that is a vernal pool's hydrology. These pools of water are ephemeral or temporary in nature. And so the source of water for vernal pools tends to be rainfall and snow melt. And so you can see why in the springtime when we have lots of rain and melting snow, it's a perfect time for these forest depressions to fill up with water. And so as the season progresses and the weather gets warmer, the water in these pools evaporates and you have basically a dry basin and it's this temporary filling and drying which really is the um, defining characteristic of vernal pools. This drying period is incredibly important for the organisms that rely on vernal pools. The reason being, without a sustainable source of water, there's one mighty group of predators that cannot establish within vernal pools. That group, of course, is fish. As it turns out, fish still reign supreme within freshwater ecosystems. Um, I would never argue against that. And the presence of fish in a wetland can have a lot of top-down effects on organisms who are lower in the food chain. However, their absence in a wetland can have equally um, large impacts and it's because organisms that would have had to worry about being eaten by fish you know previously in an environment without them obviously it's it's not a threat and so they can flourish and there's uh, an entirely different dynamic within these environments that are lacking fish so within vernal pools you see this diverse really diverse array of life so many kinds of invertebrates and uh, vertebrates, which I'll get into in a second. Um, things like fairy shrimp and, you know, caddis flies, all kinds of aquatic beetles. There's just this burst of life when the, uh, when the vernal pools are full of water. And there's one group in particular which drew me to them. I'm a herpetologist, so uh, it won't come 
as any surprise to you guys, but as it turns out, vernal pools are incredibly important for a number of amphibians. So on some of those rainy spring nights, as the pools are filling up with water, there is a really spectacular event which happens every single spring, and it's known as the amphibian migrations. So tons of frogs and salamanders migrate from their upland winter refuges, so where they were hibernating, they migrate down to vernal pools in order to breed. And so this includes species like the spring peeper, Sudacris crucifer, which is a tiny member of the tree frog family. There's also the wood frog, which is perhaps the quintessential vernal pool amphibian species. They're most famous for their ability to survive freezing temperatures. They can actually freeze and thaw out. It's a, it's a big spectacle. I, uh, I encourage you to look it up on YouTube. It's, it's pretty crazy. Within these vernal pools, both spring peepers and wood frogs essentially have these mass uh, breeding events and it can be pretty deafening because as you know frogs call and so you have just thousands and thousands of male frogs calling all at the same time and it can be damn near deafening it's uh it's definitely something Alongside the frogs that I mentioned making these migrations and having these incredible breeding events um, are salamanders. And so this, for me, is where the action is at. I absolutely love salamanders. And during these migrations, uh, these amphibian migrations, there's one kind of salamander in particular, which is known to make these, you know, long treks from their upland refuge down to the vernal pools. And they're known as mole salamanders or ambistomatids. As their name suggests, they spend a considerable amount of time underground. And the only time they surface for the most part is during these mass migrations to vernal pools. And so for herpetologists like me or you know naturalists, anyone who enjoys the outdoors, vernal pools pretty much provide us our only opportunity to see these really cool salamanders known as ambistomatids. Not all ambistomatids inhabit vernal pools, but a few of the ones that do include the yellow spotted salamander, Ambistoma maculatum, the Jefferson salamander, which is my personal favorite, Ambistoma jeffersonianum, and also the blue spotted salamander, which is a species I've never seen personally, but one that I hope to see pretty soon, hopefully this year. There's also one more ambistomatid or mole salamander which inhabits vernal pools, but it does it at a time of the year when all the other ones are gone, pretty much, and that's in the fall. The species is the marbled salamander, Ambistoma opacum, and so it has sort of a different niche than the other mole salamanders in that it breeds in the fall when the pools are dry. And so that's a whole nother story, but I couldn't talk about vernal pools to you guys without mentioning the marbled salamander because they are just absolutely awesome and they definitely warrant their own video. And as I mentioned, these salamanders are making their migrations down to the vernal pools alongside a bunch of different frogs. And they are also using the pools for breeding, much like the frogs. And so, Within these pools, you just get these short bursts of amphibian life and they lay their eggs. The eggs eventually uh, hatch and exist in the vernal pools until the pools start to dry up. And at, it's at that time that the larvae basically go through metamorphosis and um, make their way onto land. And so this really exemplifies the importance of the forested context of vernal pools that I was telling you because the organisms that rely on vernal pools do so temporarily for the most part, whether it be amphibians or the invertebrates. Um, and so an effective conservation strategy, if you're trying to conserve you know, vernal pools and the species that utilize them, has to also protect the surrounding forest. 
Um, it's just the most effective way to conserve these species and these environments. And it's something that I've heard being talked about a lot more, which, you know, brings me great joy because I think for a while, at least to my understanding, it uh, wasn't really a part of the conversation. You know, just protecting a vernal pool without protecting the surrounding forest uh, doesn't do a ton of good if, you know, we're being honest about it. So that's it, guys. Um, I'll leave you with my impression of vernal pools. To me, they're just almost like magical places where <clears throat> for the amount of space that they occupy, which is not much, they harbor such an immense amount of life. Again, whether it be uh, for vertebrates or invertebrates, I really only scratched the surface in this video. <clears throat> There's so much to cover in regard to vernal pools. I didn't, you know, talk about nutrient cycling and the fact that it supports, you know, just these vernal pools support so many uh, kinds of invertebrates, which then support amphibians, which support, you know, other kinds of wildlife, like say, you know, a green heron, which you wouldn't expect, or wood ducks and spotted turtles, just all, all kinds of wildlife. They are really awesome places. And they have a particular spot uh, in my mind or my heart, whatever you want to call it, because the very first time I went herping was with a friend of mine who took me out to uh, a forest which had some of the vernal pool species I, I talked to you about. And this was just nine years ago. The first time I went herping was in 2012. And I remember us flipping a board and there being a spotted salamander and my mind just, you know, being completely blown because I didn't know they existed. And um, I have vernal pools to thank for that. Thank you guys so much for tuning in to uh, the second episode of this natural history series. I really appreciate it. Truly, truly appreciate it. Um, if you wouldn't mind hitting the like button, subscribe, share with your friends, family members, I would greatly appreciate that. Um, until next time, again, I hope you guys get out and maybe find a local vernal pool and, you know, just enjoy, enjoy nature, get out, find all the things. Until next time, take care.